Thank you, uh, Andy. Um, can you hear me well now? Good. Um, I would like to first thank uh, Patrick and the organizer for giving me the uh, invitation and the opportunity to visit India for the first time and to putting a very nice scientific program. I think this conference has been very interesting already so far, and I'm looking forward to the next uh, uh, few days with the discussions we might have. Um, I would like to discuss the role of gas flows, um, inflows and outflows in the context of galaxy formation, um, and specifically to try to discuss observations um, that are based with on IFU observations. So here is a brief outline of, of my presentation, just to guide you. I will briefly discuss some observations about the main issues we have in our understanding of galaxy formation try to see if we can get insights on gas flows from the scaling relations, namely the Tullet Fisher, the Messi sequence, etc. And then discuss observations of the CGM with IFQs. And of course we already had a nice discussion yesterday of the multi-phase uh, phenomenon, which is galactic winds, uh, and when I say studying IFQs and CGM, you might think to put an IFQ on one of these systems and to study the kinematics. And that's not what I'm going to be discussing. I will be using IFQs in an new way to constrain the CGM with background sources. But the IFQs are key in, in, in So how do galaxy grow? Um, well, we, we all know this. You have to start from the initial fluctuations. Um, you have the potential worlds of the dark matter that are growing with time. And then that leads to uh, um, halos on which you can form galaxies due to cooling processes. And people have realized for a long time that the cooling process in low mass galaxies is very efficient and leads to the cooling problem. But namely, that in the halo mass less than 10 to the 12, the cooling process is much shorter than the, the dynamic of time. So you have a very rapid cooling in, in this process. And uh, then you have outflows we have been discussing already. This is the main topic of this conference to, um, to try to better understand the properties of these outflows. Most of these processes, inflows and outflows, are actually. Um, can be argued based on, on, on indirect arguments. Uh, the accretion and inflows mostly from the stellar population arguments, where the metallicity in the Korea solar neighborhood is not what you'd expect from a closed box model. You have to invoke out inflows. Also, the gas fractions, uh, and the, specifically the low depletion times, so that the gas mass divided by the star formation rate is very low, typically much lower than the age of the star. So uh, the gas mass in galaxies are not enough to sustain star formation for very long. So in accretion and inflows are very important. And similarly, outflows are obviously, you know, from the mass metal, from putting the metals in the IGM or CGM, the mass metal relation, and to explain the low baryon. This is the famous low baryon efficiency plot from very uh, um, collaborators. And this version, I like it because it includes like the stellar components, ratio between stellar mass and halo mass, and then the, the other line here is including the gas mass in galaxies. So you can see that if you can't account for the gas mass in galaxies, it's very difficult to, um, to fill this, this gap here of this low baryon efficiency in low mass galaxies. We heard a lot of from Jessica that uh, at this peak here around L star or Milky Way here, you might explain the gap here from the gas in the CGM. But you know, it's completely open question what's happening to low mass galaxies uh, with the CGM flow. And just to set the stage, we heard uh, Mark's argument for the precipitation uh, CGM model. But that applies really to the high masses um, uh, in clusters of galaxies specifically. Just has talked about the, the L star with the cost halo survey. And I would like to focus on the very low mass galaxies. And for that, we need to study uh, in particular because the main explanation of this is that 90% or 99% of the balance are being injected back into the uh, uh, In fact, there are really two possibilities for, for explaining this low baryon efficiency. Um, you can either suppress accretion. Um, um, a number of the papers on, uh, on the literature, modules of the literature have been discussing this. Um, as an alternative possibility for the main uh, scenario when you have outflows injecting back the uh, the, the baryons with large entrainment, large loading factors. 
And we would like to understand better this phenomenon, both um, how does the gas in and how does it get out, how far does the gas travel, and what is the geometry associated with this phenomenon. And also, more importantly, uh, how much gas is coming in and how much gas is, is coming out. Um, um, already many times. And both of these are, are critical. And that, fortunately, we can study both of these phenomena with background sources and background quasars in particular. So the wind loading factor in particular is a really a critical problem. So this ratio between star, uh, oscillator rate and star formation rate of function of halo mass. Um, you can see here the different models from different simulations have very different predictions. Uh, the, the, the fire simulation is th this line here. The illustrious simulation is that one here. And then you have other uh, predictions here from different lines of argument. But there's really no consensus. There's really free parameters that people have in galactic formation to match certain observations. And it's very, usually it's very difficult to match many observations with just that uh, one free parameter. You have quickly tensions arising between, say, the luminosity function or the mass metallic situation or the gas fraction. So to illustrate a little bit um, these phenomena of accretion and or inflows and outflows, I'd like to start with the um, observations in the local universe of M82, which we have seen already, uh, different aspects of, uh, with the different phases. And then the local H1 surveys, which are shown here, showing that there's a large amount of material, a large amount of coal gas that extends much further out than the star. The uh, H1 uh, disks here extend very far out, sometimes uh, up to 30 kiloparsecs. So that's um, so the old cartoon representation similar to gases, where you have outflows that are driving material out of the disk, particularly to the, to the galaxy formation, to the star formation, the side of the star formation. And then you have some somehow gas falling in or from the CGM or the IGM um, on the large scale structures and joining the disk in the inner regions in this kind of joint, uh, connecting regions. There is no name for it, but we are. Uh, that's, I think, where you connect uh, the gas that's coming in and falling in from the IGN uh, onto the, um, the, the spiral of the galaxy. And also, that's very important to bring the gas in a, in a plane like this because you bring also, of course, a lot of angular momentum. And there's a recent paper by Faith Walter and his collaborator, which I'm not going to try to pronounce his name, uh, but it shows the recent stacking of, uh, of H1 data on a number of local galaxies that these H1 profiles extend to very large radii, up to 40 kiloparsecs. And by the stacking, by removing the kinematics and stacking in three dimensions, they can throw very low surface brightness or very low column density in H1. And they have, they've seen no sign of edges in these H1 profiles. They continually uh, uh, continue as exponential very far. So if you put then this in the context of the CGM, in, in yes. the part when the CGM would be the gas within 100 kiloparsecs, have a significant cross-section. And so also I think I would say that the mass in H1 is not necessarily related to star formation because typically this, this exponential profile have a break in the inner regions where you do have star formation. And that's where you have dominated by the molecular gas, which is the, the gas driving the star formation. So it's very, I think, dangerous to correlate the mass of H1 to the properties of the CGM or, or the star formation. Another um, caveat I want to bring in right at the beginning is to the possibility to have a complex situation. We heard a lot of these uh, AMD2 as opposed to chart for driving winds and so forth, but we don't already know how far this, this material go. Um, but AMD2 lies in a group. Uh, and this AMD2, AMD1 group is nicely shown here, connected by this H1 again uh, filaments. There are uh, arms that are connecting these different galaxies because they are not. Get back on quasars, start passing through this. You have to work into question this possible problem of your interpretation. I will come back to that and or can already tell you that it's not an main issue. Okay, so um, now moving on to the insight from the scaling relations. So very briefly, in the main sequence of so this relation between star formation rate and stellar mass has been shown to be really insensitive to feedback. Uh, there's a very simple argument for this, because if you have the star formation rate due to feedback processes, then the stellar mass, which is the integral of the star formation rate, would be half of, 
as well. So then, therefore, you you remain on the main sequence. This is nicely shown by these uh, papers. So there's really no effect on the main sequence from outflows. Of course, that affects a lot the, the baryon content of galaxies, but not the itself. People have been involved that the Tully Fisher is a signature of outflows. Um, so the Tully Fisher duration between the baryonic mass of galaxies and the and the circular velocity is not is following a, a scaling relation of v to the four, which is not what you expect for dark matter halo. And that has led some people, like in this uh, in this paper, to uh, put the interpretation from uh, many years before as well that the discrepancy between these two curves is due to these feedback processes, and therefore you can infer uh, by using a mass continuity argument that the loading factor that you would need to uh, match these observations to the expectation is uh, with a loading factor um, that goes to one over v, pretty much like the momentum driven with. But if you do that, um, you have an additional constraint also that comes between the barons and the halo masses from the halo occupation, or uh, the baryon efficiency that I showed you at the beginning. And I don't think it's completely consistent if you use these two observations together. Um, so that shows you that the situation is not as simple as that. So what you should do is to uh, try to understand galaxy formation in this global sense. And this is uh, that can be done here very simply with this uh, continuity equation. So this is the continuity equation of gas accretion uh, fed by cosmology, star formation rate, and an outflow term. And then the other key equation to this system is the uh, star formation law from Kenny Kirchmade, or something like this, when the star formation is published with the gas mass. And you can find that in this very simple system of equation, you quickly reach an equilibrium no matter what the initial conditions are, and no matter what the outflows are. And this shows that this, uh, um, and this, this happens as so long as the um, time for star formation rate here is shorter than time for the accretion rate, the variations in the, time, in the accretion rate. So as long as you have that condition, which you have for most uh, wretched below wretched four, then you quickly reach a quasi equilibrium where star formation rate and gas mass are completely driven by the evolution of the accretion rate, and not, not by outflows. Now, if you want to constrain outflows, you have to then look at the metallicity of, of galaxies. And a number of people have done this, um, dating back from the uh, leaky box, first the closed box models and the leaky box models, um, and, and now well, with more modern approach. I think what's new now is that we know what the equation rate is from simulation. This is not well quantified, this, whereas in these leaky box, people put this as a free parameter. So this is actually uh, now a mistake if you do that because now we know what the equation rate is. Um, another issue is that with the metallicity here, equation, yeah, this is the derivative of the metallicity depends on the yield and then the equation rate and the star formation rate. Uh, and, but the time scale for the metallicity uh, evolution is very long, longer <coughs> than the time scale for star formation rate. So in, if you can show that this will lead to an equilibrium metallicity, but that happens on the longer time scale. So as opposed to here, when the continuity equation quickly reaches an equilibrium where this, this term here goes to zero, this is not the case. Whereas in the literature, people do force that to zero, like in science or Rumi's uh, analysis. What you should really do is to combine these three equations, solve them, uh, and to use observation of gas fractions and metallicity simultaneously than to refer back constraints of the accretion and uh, outflow, uh, outflow rates. And so far, I think there's a one paper that has done this more or less than possibly by, by uh, the heat in, in Hawaii. I want to show, illustrate that, um, I, well, I want to first emphasize that if you, if there are students here interested in this subject, there is room here to improve, uh, to do this self consistently. Um, and to put global constraints on outflows from observations. To show you a little bit of what, why it's difficult, I mean, David and his collaborators, the student Mitro, and uh, when they use the baryon fraction, the metallicity, uh, mass metallicity duration, and the main sequence, and simultaneously try to put constraints on their model, which is very similar to the one I just showed. Um, uh, and what they find is that um, they find constraints on the outflow rate, which is shown here, this is the loading factor, and then they find a constraint on the inflow rate which is constrained to be on a narrow mass range. But I want to emphasize that the outflow rate and loading factor that they find in this paper is very steep. It's one of them, the mass, or one of the, the cube of the velocity. 
which is, I think, not consistent with, with observations. And so then this line would be like, like one of these lines here, where most of the observations tend to favor this one. And these lines down here I didn't mention before, but now I can tell you that these were the constraints you get from the mass metallic simulation. So these would be more or less like the net outflow rate or the net load factor, whereas this would be more like the injected uh, loading factor we put in, in simulations. Now, I agree with, with Mark from yesterday that here there's a bit of an issue because they're not necessarily defined at the same location. So we have to do a better job now at making uh, comparing apples with apples. So this is my takeaway from the global properties of uh, galaxies from gas flows. Um, do not use a single uh, scaling relations that's not sufficient to constrain outflows or inflows because they tend to be uh, degenerate. Um, so far, um, the constraints uh, or predictions are not completely consistent, consistent, and they still need uh, room for using new surveys for mass on mass uh, gas fractions, and metallicity, and especially when you have both information at the same time. In addition to the other known um, main sequence and the baryon uh, fractions, to put strong constraints on the outflow um, and inflows of galaxies. So let's now move like move um, towards uh, the, the CGM studies with IFU. So uh, I will uh, now discuss how we can use CGM studies a little bit like in just uh, presentation with background sources, background quasars. Um, scattered around here um, to, as a tool to study gas flows. I think, um, Jeff's presentation was very nice to describe the properties of the CGM, but did not conclude very strongly on the kinematics of, of the flow of gas in, in the CGM. Um, just to contrast with galaxy spectroscopy, so this is when you have to take a spectra of a galaxy, um, what you see here typically is a blue shifted line. Uh, as reviewed by Sylvain yesterday, and that seems to be one of the main um, um, uh, observables that you can get from, from these uh, type of observations. And indeed, it seems like this outflow velocity is that seems to scale with some of the galaxy properties. This is a nice paper by Tim Heckman in some, some of these samples, including extreme starbursts, where it shows that the velocity is proportional to the surface density. It's much more, more difficult to infer an outflow rate, which is really what you want, the outflow rate, um, because you don't know where the gas is. The gas here that you see blue shifted, it could be 100 parsec, um, a kiloparsec, or 10 kiloparsec in front of the galaxy. You have no idea. So you have orders of magnitude and certainty here, here. And so that is one of the ingredients that you need to infer outflow rates. And moreover, you don't know anything about the geometry. Is, is the flow full, completely spherically symmetric? With four winds, or is it biconical, like uh, we've um, discussed the uh, past few days? And also, you have a middle line, like sodium or magnesium, so you don't really know how to go from that to a total gas or not. People doesn't prevent people from trying, um, and it's not always self consistent. Uh, and the assumptions are not always self consistent, but yet they get the same result. So, um, this is a bit of a word of caution. Um, I'm not going to go into the too much of the detail, just to say that some of the work here by doing more advanced ionization modeling put the wind at 50 parsecs. All the material in the blue shifted line is 50 parsecs from the galaxy. And other people use 4 pi winds um, and some kind. So uh, this is really something very difficult to do where we don't have a clear answer. But if you have a background equator, um, you have more information. Um, if you have a background quasar passing near a star forming galaxy, um, you have, of course, the impact parameter that gives you the distance of the gas. And also, you have the velocity shift from the systemic redshift to the uh, absorption that gives you some kinematic information, what you need here in this equation. And if also, you can possibly measure the column density directly. And statistically, if you have a large circle of objects, you can constrain them the opening angle of the flow. Um, and the geometry. Now, the problem with this approach is that, um, well, two problems. One is that the geometry matters um, because, of course, I show you like a case when the wind was pointing that towards the line of sight of the quasar, but the wind could be pointing away from the line of sight. In this case, you would not be studying the wind. So your interpretation might change if you did not know the inclination of the galaxy. So that's a critical 
aspect. The advantage of that is you can then study both inflows and outflows in the same observation. And of course, it's rare, so you have to devise uh, proper strategies to have large samples of both our And we we'll be reviewing uh, all of them. Um, just to uh, summarize, there's also work by uh, uh, and now it's collaborators with Quasar probing Quasar, I'm not going to talk about this. There's been already quite a bit of uh, work on galaxies probing by galaxies by random and stacking in cosmos, in addition to the special case by Kate Rubin. Uh, I'll come back to this uh, later in my talk. I want to now move to the Quasar probing galaxies aspect. But before that, um, there's a new result by Sebastian Lopez that appears in Nature where they don't use a single galaxy probing the hill CGM of another galaxy in the foreground, but they use a lens galaxy. In this case, that is of first uh, continuous background sources when they can then look at magnetism in absorption and probe the cinematic and the amount of absorption over a large area around a single galaxy. So this is a very nice tool, a very promising now new avenue to study the CGM with large IFUs such as KCWR or MUSE. Um, at the moment, this is a single object. I think there, I hear that the more coming people are finding it very easy to do this in uh, in this type of observations. So it's not clear what exactly new constraints we will have. Now, for quasar probing galaxies, there are two types of studies. There's the studies where you start, like in Jess's presentation, with galaxy selections. And then you, you look for a quasar nearby, but you start with a galaxy selection so you know the galaxy property. So that's all you can do in the Carcedo survey, M star galaxy, or M star galaxy. The alternative is to use absorption selected surveys where you start with a catalog of absorption lines, like magnesium or H1, or other lines, and then you look for the galaxies associated with that absorption after the fact. So you know, you know the property of the absorption before, not anything about the galaxy. And finally, you can do it blindly, like we have, we'll hear a talk from Sobat later on, when you have uh, you no information about um, associations, but you do statistical analysis on the uh, absorption related to the galaxies in the environment. It's not clear to me exactly, so these are the different galaxy selected surveys, the cost of the world, cost of birth, cost of birth. Martin collaborators. But for the H1 surveys, in particular the cost hero, um, it's not clear to me if the, if the loop has been closed with absorption selected surveys when you, we do the opposite. We start with H1 or Laman limit systems and you look at the galaxies in the field. I'll come back to that later. Um, I want to just emphasize, because we talked about already a lot about the Carcedo and the Cos Dwarf, um, I would like to emphasize the other one, the Cos Gas Survey, which is a very nice experiment. In fact, it's a very, very uh, a beautiful experiment. So we start with galaxies which you know the gas properties, like from H1 and CO observations, and then you look at the CGM properties with COS. Um, but unfortunately, I think in this survey, the, the background quasars, in, in galaxies that you could find near the bar, the, these quasars, are very far away. So very large impact from them. So we just talked about the CGM within 150 or 100 kilo parsec, but most of the side lines are much larger impact from them. So I'm worried about that, trying to make correlations between large distance gas out there and the inner regions of galaxies. And similarly, the cost birth is also a very nice experiment by Tim Heckman. So there you, you select starbursts with extreme um, G4000 um, properties, so you, you know they're post-starbursts or extreme starbursts. And you look at the properties in the CGM with cost again, when you can find a pair of a quasar passing nearby. But again, it's very difficult to find that Quasar nearby a galaxy in the first place. So in this particular case, it's even more difficult with, with Starburst. And the impact parameters are also very large. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it, it's, a fine, it's a fine experiment, but if you want to correlate that with the properties of the galaxy inside, I think it's becoming very dangerous for, for two reasons. One is because a lot of things are happening in the inner 50 kiloprosec or 80 kiloprosec, and two, the travel time is very large. So uh, you're trying to, even for outflows, the travel time to 50 kiloprosec is a few hundred million years. So uh, the travel time to 150 is going to be a few giga years. So you, how can you then correlate the, the event that happens here to what's out there when there's a delay of, of two giga years? Maybe 
I think just showed that there's a correlation here, but I'm, I'm looking at the plot. I'm not convinced. Please, that's what they say in their papers. So, another pot potential uh, bias, and I'm doing the, here to provoke the reaction from Jess, uh, is that <laughs> these, these surveys are uh, mass selected in shallow surveys. So they're galaxy selection, and so they know the properties of the galaxy very well. But from Sloan typically. So they know the stellar mass and this, this survey, Sloan in particular, is a very shallow survey. And you don't know really if within 150 kiloparsec you don't have a fainter galaxy in between. And, uh, and this can only be addressed with IFU surveys like MUSE or KCDWR when you have a very large sensitivity in star forming galaxies. Where, in particular with MUSE, you go down to 10 to minus 1. Uh, in star formation rate. So therefore, you can probe in the field of view all the galaxies down to this limit, and you can be confident that there's nothing in between 100 degree possible galaxies. I think the cost halo survey is probably the safest because you have the closest impact time. We also have, though, so, uh, like I think, CGM squared, all the spectroscopy of all the faint galaxies, the multi slit spectroscopy. We have Alaric spectroscopy for star formation rate, so it's not just based on the slow stuff. So we did the initial selection of the slow slit. Okay. So I think I'm looking forward to see the result of the CGM square. And, and in our case, with MUSE, we can do all the galaxies without first selection. So I think that's an advantage with IFU compared to multi-slit. Sure. But you have a smaller yeah. well, it's, it's OK to go to 250 uh, 200 kilo parsec or So now go back to galaxy, quasar probing uh, galaxies around. Uh, Star forming galaxies in particular, I already discussed some of these surveys. Now I want to move on the absorption selected surveys. Um, I would not have the time to review all of them. I would like to emphasize two that I've been involved with that are magnetism two selected surveys. Um, uh, the, the, the galaxy selections uh, typically have also a low success rate. So in this case, you select galaxies prior with Sloan or at rigid point two, and you use ADRS to find the absorption CAC. And you find typically a success rate of 30%. The carbon fraction in general is on average 30%. So this, this is great for some things, some of the questions you might want to ask, but the efficiency is not as high as you would like. Whereas if you do a selection on magnesium first hand and then you look for the galaxy afterwards with IFUs, you have an 80% detection rate. Of course, now you have magnesium in the main ways, so that's you don't throw away the 70% which you don't. And magnesium is, is great uh, for a number of reasons. Um, uh, first, it's a doublet, and so it's very easily identified in the fiber in low resolution spectra, like in Sloan. And it's in the optical, so you can cover a wide range of range from 0.4 to 1.4, um, or even higher. Uh, this is the range of range associated to O2, in fact, but whatever. Um, it has a low ionization potential, uh, so we don't. It is present even in the case of low uh, uh, neutral gas. And also, uh, it has many health benefits. <laughs> in particular, you know, you may find out that uh, it reduces stress, gives you better sleep, uh, and you can find it in some great food like chocolate. Uh, I don't have chocolate with me, but since I'm doing public speaking and I'm stressed, I'm going to take some. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I didn't choke. Um, so, magnesium 2 is great. So you know, two parts of um, and it's um, uh, This was done in the uh, late 80s and early 90s by Jacqueline Bergeron. So, it was the first to actually identify the galaxies associated with strong magnesium 2 absorbers. And as you said, this technique traditionally involves deep imaging and doing spectroscopy follow up with multi slit. Um, or single slit or multiple galaxies. And this is an attempt to be very expensive. And also, you, you bias yourself with a, a continuum selection. But I don't have the, the original plot, but if you go back to these early work by Chuck Steidel or, or Ken Lazetta or other people, what they found with these even uh, first surveys is that there is a strong anti correlation between the absorption strength and the impact parameter. That goes like this, um, and this is uh, something that you see with a lot of um, my, a lot of absorption systems have functional impact parameters. 
Um, but this is actually a great tool when you have a survey or an instrument that has a smaller field of view, you can do a selection on magnitude two and four width and to ensure that you galaxy would fall within the field of view. That's what we'll be using. So first, we were using a small IFU like Symphony as a field of view of eight arc seconds, so we were restricting ourselves to very large equivalent width. So small impact parameters now with mu, you can restrict that a little bit. So we have been using this anti-correlation as a tool um, to tune our survey to the field of view. Uh, so this is a, a minus of two survey, so we have a, a spec Magnetism 2 somewhere, and some redshift between the equator and the observer. We don't know where the galaxy is. Um, and initially, we first did that with um, Symphony, with, as I said, you eight arc seconds. And if you the great, because you just point at this equator, and you tune your wavelength to the emission that you expect to that redshift. And then up, you find your galaxy. You, you're done. You don't have to do anything else than, than this one shot observation. And moreover, you get more information. You get the star formation rate, because typically you have lines. We use line H alpha or O2. So you have the star formation rate and you have the kinematics. Again, this is a one single shot observation. So you can constrain the dynamical mass of the galaxy and also the morphology and the, incl the inclination and its size. So you have a lot of information with this one single observation. That's why I think IFUs are great to study the CGM in this manner, with PACON, with a combination of PACON sources. Uh, the inclination uh, with IFU is just a plug from a tool with the observers and the audience to do 3D uh, fitting of the observations. There's also something with Rico uh, doing something similar. I'm really, you can ask me if you want, but getting the inclination is really critical because as you can see here, depending on the orientation of the odd flow, the interpretation of the impact on the absorption of the line of sight will be slightly or very different. And to show this, let's just put a very simple tall model for arc flows. We start uh, this picture that we discussed yesterday with a hot medium pushing on entraining this cold material. Um, and we assume that a steady flow, mass conservation, so the density of these clouds now goes at one of our square. And uh, far out, once you're out of this acceleration region, we can assume that the velocity of the arc flow is constant. And if you use a very simple uh, tall model for arc flows, you can then try to predict what would be the tidal absorption you would get as a function of the inclination of the galaxy with respect to the line of sight. Of course, when it's perpendicular exactly, you have an absorption that's symmetric, and it's, when it's more and more inclined, more and more asymmetric. So what we do now is to compare that to uh, real observations, and this is a work done a couple of years ago uh, with Symphony um, of the galaxy at redshift um, uh, one-ish, and where we have also HST imaging, so we can confirm the inclination if you're not sure about the technique. It's highly uh, inclined galaxy, um, and then we can compare the u based absorption spectra to what we would get from this very simple geometric model. In this case, therefore, this allows you us to constrain the location of the gas, of course, from the impact parameter, but then the kinematics of the wind from these uh, profiles and the velocity shifts. That information together, then we can put very strong constraints on the outflow rates uh, of galaxies at these, um, these redshifts. Here's another example um, with the impact parameter slightly larger, um, but similarly with the um, But the key the message to take away from here is that geometry really matters uh, to the point where um, the galaxy could be face on or the line of sight could be aligned with a, with a major axis of the galaxy. Of course, there's a, there's a third dimension, right? In this case, you might think that the outflows will reach back the, the line of sight, but you have a third dimension point that could be perpendicular, uh, completely with line of sight. Um, and I want to illustrate some of these cases now. We have studied gas inflows and the gas that's coming in here at large uh, impact parameters, but aligned with the disk of the galaxy. This is one paper that we did a couple of years ago in science, where we were able, at Redshift 2, we were to compare the, this is the galaxy, and this is the kinematics of the galaxy, the rotation curve, and we were comparing the uh, kinematics that you expect at the 29, or uh, for exactly 29, 25 kiloparsecs away from the galaxy to what you'd expect from this rotation that's shown here. And when you compare the absorption spectra with the low ionization lines, not just, in this case, we have multiple like, low ionization lines, um, including zinc and silicon, 
you can see there's a strong uh, component at intermediate velocity, but they all co-rotate with the galaxy, but with speeds that are less than the rotation speed. And you can then play the same room, same game, putting a constraint on the amount of accretion, the accretion speed for radial flow. We know the impact parameter, and the column that sleeves, in this case, is measured, so we have a constraint on the total accretion rate, which is comparable to the star. What's interesting about this galaxy is that uh, in this, this context of this conference is that uh, it, while the local ionization lines I just showed you that are all co-rotating with the galaxy, so this zero line here, the systemic redshift is this red line here. But it seems to be also embedded, if you look back at the old paper by, by Andy, that uh, the uh, oxygen 6 and carbon 4, they are much more symmetric, symmetrically distributed around this, uh, this, uh, this redshift. So uh, it's really consistent with the picture when you have the low ionization line here probing this gas co-rotating with the galaxy here in the inner regions, and then you have this hot medium that is more symmetric and blue and red from this galaxy. In this case, it was around 25 kiloparsec. So it's very close. Okay, so that was, these were a few single uh, examples, and maybe they're not too convincing. So let's try to build now a survey where you have statistics. Um, so this is where Muse comes in. Muse is a large IFU with one arc minus field of view with a large wavelength range. So this wavelength range allows us to do a, a, a multiplexing experiment. So we select quasar sidelines with multiple magnetism 2 absorbers. So we have strong magnetism 2 absorbers at three, four, or five different redshifts that are completely independent of one another over um, from redshift 0.4 to 1.4. That redshift corresponds to the uh, O2 that you would get in the Muse uh, observations. And then all you have to do is to select the wavelength plane uh, corresponding to this redshift to find the galaxy. And we can also do the more advanced experiments to look at all the galaxies within 100 the parsec and to look at the properties of this uh, gas and absorption. Uh, this is to show that the Muse is a really a great instrument, um, has the highest throughput in the VLT in terms of. Uh, instrument. Uh, now it's available with laser, so we can correct for uh, the ground layer with this adapted, complex adaptive system, adapted, adapted optics system. It's very sensitive, so this is the star formation rate of the functional redshift. And typically two hours observations, we get, this is the blue line, we get a star formation rate limit of redshift 1 around minus, minus 1. So we get very low sensitivity in a couple of hours of, sense of uh, integrations. This diagram here is done for H beta. So this is the H beta limit for 10 hours. But so a survey is to uh, uh, survey now about 20 fields um, in, with MUSE that with multiple magnetism 2 absorbers, 3, 4, 5, with this range of equivalent width, I began to match the field of view of the instrument. And we end up with a survey of about 80 pairs or higher um, magnetism 2 galaxy pairs. This is just, you know, we have multiple absorbers, and then with Mu, we can find the galaxies for each of these absorption um, in one shot. Okay, so let's go back to the question I raised at the beginning. So how many galaxies do we have now um, for a single absorption? So imagine you have a sideline going through a system like this. This is the ME1, ME2 group. It's messy. And then uh, what do you see with Mu? You know, with the sensitivity we have, we surely should be able to detect ME2. Two and maybe one, which has information in the the histogram from our uh, Muse Megaflow survey. Now, for a large sample of 80 uh, pairs, the majority of the pairs in the sample, so the number of galaxies within 100 kiloparsecs, show that there's only one galaxy per uh, 100 kiloparsec. Very rarely we see more than one galaxy. Sometimes we do see groups with two or three galaxies, but it's very rare. That's one absorber at redshift point seven ish, and now we look at um, the O2, the corresponding O2 um, emitter in this field, because we know the redshift, so we can tune the VI few to that wavelength. That's the galaxy we found here. So that's for one system at one redshift, and we have 85 of them. So for statistically, for all of them, the histogram gives you the number of galaxies within 100 kiloparsec from that quasar sideline, which is the X here. That's the histogram. And we can do more. 
because also people say, well, maybe you know you have a survey that is also flux limited in star formation. Maybe if you go deeper, you will start more galaxies popping in here. So we did that. Uh, we went to 10-hour integrations. Now we go to much deeper uh, uh, sensitivity in star formation rate. And uh, this is the result here uh, the cut from the press. And we don't find any more galaxies. We might, you don't see it here, but it might be a little tiny satellite around that primary galaxy. But we don't find any more neighbors or small galaxies. What's the velocity window? We do a range that we scan the velocity range, typically a few 200 kilometers per second, but we do a little bit more also to make sure we're not missing anything. So, uh, so this is in, in contrast, I think, to um, some of the H1 work where uh, uh, the uh, Carcelo in particular show that the uh, H1 is more or less statistically distributed around galaxies the, uh, uniformly. Uh, there's a nice paper by Ramon about trying to see that, trying to show that there's also a halo size, a halo mass uh, size relation in this, in this plane. I also, from observations from Muse, now we can see that in emission, lemon alpha here is filling in around bright quasars, around, around quasars here, uh, by by a um, number of groups, including uh, the case of the other people here, um, show that there's a very large nebula around um, quasars that are probably illuminated by the quasars, filling the field of view one arc minute. So these are large, like a few hundred to a half second crops. For the oxygen six, um, it's not clear to me what's going on. Uh, it seems like um, some people claim that it's also a bimodal distribution. Let me now just go back to uh, results on the statistics of magnetism 2 uh, absorbers and the magnetism 2 galaxy pairs. Uh, what we found here is a very strong signal for non anthropic distribution of the magnetism 2 gas around galaxies. So this alpha here is the x axis in these two plots is the angle between the qua apparent quasar location and the galaxy major axis. So it, that's where I feel great because you can detect, determine the major axis very easily from the, uh, the kinematic. Initially, we had a small sample of about 1,000 galaxies. But now, with about 60 galaxy uh, quasar pairs, um, we find this very strong biomolecular distribution uh, for the magnetism 2 probe. Yeah. So magnetism 2 is tracing gas either on the minor axis, very strongly, and or, or on the major axis. This sort of a distribution here that goes to about 50 degrees gives us an insight about sort of the core opening angle about plus or minus 30 degrees. And it does seem to be a bit sharper for the major axis. That one. And now I'm going to quickly show some of the uh, results from what we have here um, from magnetism two surveys. Um, I think the, not only it's, isotro it's not isotropic, it's anisotropic. But the properties are also very different. So the properties of gas um, probed by these by these magnetism two sidelines along the major axis or along the minor axis have very different physical properties. The rate of dependence is not the same in both cases. It's much flatter for the winds as it is for the um, for the for the extended gaseous disks. For the wind, we think we can understand and explain this flat relation that goes at one over r, one over b, the impact parameter with a very simple bioconical model when you have mass observation. At least in that case, you get one over R uh, dependent on the supply. Now I want to go back to the result by Ramdan on the galaxy, background galaxy survey that he did um, with Cosmos, which shows also that it found the different radial dependence between the, uh, the, the wind uh, sidelines and along the minor axis and the disk sidelines along the major axis. We haven't done any work comparing these two uh, probes, but I think that's something to be done um, because now that would provide us new, new uh, uh, interesting constraints on the carbon fraction of the gas. That's from the new survey here um, on the wind sight lines. You see very, very shallow dependence with impact Um In a few minutes now, I'm going to focus on the um, results of the sight lines where the quasar is aligned with the minor axis, and we can, as in King Hegmai, compare now the, the outflow velocity uh, as a function of surface density. This is what we find here, this is what I showed you before. This is the outflow speed now as a function of gas, uh, star formation rate surface density. 
it seems like also they extend the lower regime here of Hagrid's example. In terms of the loading factor, um, this is on the right. With, uh, the loading factor is a function of halo mass, galaxy mass. We tend to find a, halo, a loading factor around unity in all cases. Very weak dependence on halo mass, or if at all. And what's interesting is that if you compare now the wind speed to the escape velocity for the halo mass, it seems like most of the gas is not escaping, at least above to the mass threshold, where the wind speed could only be escaping at the um, lowest mass. So, um, in terms of on the sidelines where now the quasar is aligned with the major axis, uh, so studying the ga extended gaseous disk around galaxies, um, I showed you already this plot by Finn and Walter and his collaborator when you see this H1 from 21 centimeter extending very far to 40 kiloparsec. If you take this exponential profile, and put that in this on this diagram of the equivalent weight of magnesium as a function of uh, impact parameter, because you can convert that into also a column. And so you can typically get uh, lines that are typically like this. In the most extreme case, you get something like this. Um, so I think it's becoming quite interesting to compare a constraint of the extended gaseous disk with a 21 centimeter and with the quasars, because there's no overlapping regime when you can uh, study the gas uh, at those large distances between 20 and 50 kiloparsec. Briefly, also, this is nice. We can do with one background quasar, but of course, it would be better if you have multiple background quasars on a single galaxy. This is work that uh, David Barn showed a couple of years ago, studying again this gaseous disk with some four background quasars. And the interpretation is not so easy, but by using sort of an extended gaseous disk. Uh, models in the kinematics, they find that the gas kinematics of this uh, disk is rotating more slowly than the central object, and it's more consistent with the gas used disk extending out to uh, 50 kiloparsec. Right, right. So I think my interpretation is that because it's rotating more slowly, like in the case I've shown you with background quasar and high redshift, it's an indication that you have radio inflow. And we are trying, we now we're in the process of trying to put, to quantify how much regular inflow you have and how much, uh, how would that turn up in the signatures of the uh, kinematic offsets between the rotation and the observed observe, observe uh, shift between the, <coughs> the disk kinematics and the observed kinematics. So I'm going to put my conclusions that um, outflows and inflows are not co spatial. So it's very critical when you study the CGM to know the inclination of the ga your galaxy in order to, to make uh, inference about gas flows, whether in or out. We don't seem to see, that, at least in the mass regime where we are probing a high mass, that the winds uh, are sufficiently fast enough to escape, at least the low ionization uh, part of the wind. They travel up to 100 kiloparsec, that's how far we can trace them with, with magnesium. Um, and the carry enough mass, I think it seems like probably not, because in the mass regime where we are, we probably expect a loading factor to explain the low variance fraction of galaxies, uh, seven L star galaxies. Where what we find is the loading factor is around unity and it's constant with mass. So I'll that and take the <coughs> question. Thank you very much. Why mass will factor such a such a problem? To explain the low uh, viral fractions. At the beginning, I'm just catch you. So um, here, in low mass, I have your uh, sun star, 
when you use the various tools to choose. Um, most cosmological simulations rely on the fact that you inject all the parameters back into the engineering. You have to go through the galaxy. So the gas has to go through the gas, and that's why you need very large rolling factors. What if the gas is from a cleaning in the first place? Ah, that's a lovely thing. This is the second possible that we have here. Um, and this is tomorrow's presentation that's more space than high mass. Uh, it's not, it's currently, the thinking is that it's very difficult to make this work for the low mass region. Uh, what's the problem? There is a state in the equation of the Objects are generally known as galaxies because if you count the number of the star, there's no resistance to the objects going to the other. There's one other possibility that's often discussed in this context is uh, the effect of the local energy uh, sources or star feeding galaxies that may have on the cooling. All of this cooling argument will have a collision in the future. mass loadings of 10 at redshift, like 2 to 3, and naturally it'll ramp down to 1. And in fact, I think that's important to preserving a uh, thin disk. If you, if you had a high mass loadings at, at low redshift, you would end up puffing up your disk much more than we see observationally. So I, I don't necessarily think that uh, observa like observations of mass loadings of one inch at low redshift is inconsistent with the sort of pictures and cosmological simulations are painting now. It's also possible that the mass loading effect. Uh, 
No, 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 no. So the hair was a few minutes ago. Um, I had a point to wear the hair. The, 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 so I want this password. So I'm sorry, I see how that happens. Okay, so it might be, it might be a little bit more. Today, the real reason is more than 50 but then your 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 operation uh, tries guess how to uh, handle it. Yeah, easy. So I mean, when uh, you say like this guess how to say the name of the operation, the answer is yes, 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 yes. Okay. Okay. So I have a good question. How the cost cancel is that? You pointed out you have to be very careful connecting what's going on in the CGI. With H1 and then also get a nice But empirically, there is a correlation. Just want to make sure. Were you questioning that it's a correlation at all, or were you questioning what it means in terms of the CGM? The correlation is like a three sigma thing. So looking at it, it's not that pixel. Um, so it, it's possible that there is something there. I don't know. I, I love that experiment. When I look at the impact numbers, it's like I mean, the travel time is so large. But then, why is it clearly right? Yeah, that's, 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 that's the point. I'm just saying observation. If you just look at the data, you look at the equivalent width of the lemon out and then how much each one there is in the balance. Just without the theory, do you believe that? So, it's a three sigma result. Like, uh, like to see more. Okay. I don't know. It is. Yeah, I think it's a three sigma result. It might be a little more. I don't know. I wish Sam could be. But to her, she was over She was, no, no, absolutely not. She was just, if you break the results. Okay, any last questions? Okay, let's thank Nicola and all the speakers for that.